Welcome back to Ye Old Degreelessness, Lords and Ladies. I'm your host, Shanghai Pete, the people's champion and 21st century digital boy. Hope you've all been having fun since we last spoke. I know I certainly haven't, though it has not been for lack of trying. I went down to my local weed shop today only to find a dude out front handing out cars with their new address on it. You guys, you wouldn't believe how often dispensaries, especially the um, extra legal ones, move around in LA. It's a pain in the fucking ass. Always having to track these dudes down in places that are intentionally hard to find with like no signage out front or anything. So after paying like $17 for a rush hour lift, not even a mile down the road, I had to then hoof it across the fashion district to track down these guys' new spot. In the end, it all worked out, but like, damn, I was, I was not expecting that kind of fiasco today. I don't know really why I'm talking about this, but anyways, video game stuff. Uh, we need to get right inside today's main story because of, well, several reasons. One, because I took way too long to do this and I feel kind of bad, but also because there's nothing really interesting to recap from the past week. So with that said, let's talk some shit. So before we go any further, we need to talk about fan expectations. And any conversation about fan expectations has got to at least start with the whole werewolves and vampires versus zombies and et cetera, et cetera discourse. Now, the first part of this, at least, is not going to be about my personal preference, but instead about what I think was necessary for the brand. And at this point, I think it's clear that reimagining and reinventing the core threats of Resident Evil was not just a good idea, it was a necessity. It was inevitable, even. Like, if you think about it, how long can you fight the same exact monster be before it becomes so familiar that it's no longer a monster, but like just another thing, an obstacle you navigate around instinctively rather than actively the way that you would engage or react to a true threat. And essentially, that's because familiarity is the absence of the unknown. And to paraphrase H.P. Lovecraft, the unknown is the oldest and strongest kind of fear. It is the foundation and beginning of anything that we perceive as dangerous or threatening. In fact, the word monster effectively functions simply as a method of cataloging or labeling the unknown, so it can then be dealt with in terms that we can understand. If you think about it, the word monster is usually only appropriate where there exists an absence of knowledge about something or someone. We call things monsters most often because we lack the needed info to apply more appropriate or specific language. For example, you wouldn't call a raccoon or like a cute little kitty a monster because we have a complete understanding of what those things are. Of course, that doesn't mean that things can't exhibit monstrous qualities as well. Obviously, many things can. Things can certainly behave monstrously at times. So what would someone or something need to do then to make it appropriate to label their behavior as monstrous? Easy. You know someone is being monstrous when their actions are so extreme that they exceed the bounds of universal human reason. And anything outside of common human reasoning is by definition unknown. For example, and I know this particular example has been done to death, but I mean, there's a reason for it. So for example, physically, Hitler was no different from you or I yet he's still infamous for being a monster. Well, that's because unlike a zombie or werewolf where the monstrosity is physicality, with Hitler, the yawning chasm of the unknowable and indescribable was in his mind instead, a mind that produced and executed ideas and machinations so abhorrent and utterly anathema to the human psyche that most people just instinctively recoil in horror from them. Far better to allow our instincts to preserve sanity to reflexively reject the inconceivable rather than risk looking directly at it. So whether you're pissing yourself running from a werewolf or desperately trying to hold the fraying edges of your sanity together, both reactions have the same root cause, fear, fear of the unknown. And if you spend enough time shooting at something scary, eventually the unknown that's causing that fear will be replaced with familiarity, regardless of how scary something may have been at one point. And when that happens, it ceases to be an effective threat. And a game with enemies that don't provoke a threat response from the player, it's not gonna work, even if they are zombies, which are objectively some of the coolest monsters that have ever been created. And that class is what happens when you smoke a little bit more than you intended before trying to explain something you're still not entirely sure makes sense. It did give me an excuse to quote Lovecraft though, so totally worth it. The point I'm trying to make though, is that with enough exposure, familiarity can normalize almost any monster. That's why evolving beyond the kitsch and shambling zombies that define the early entries in the series was not just a smart move for Resident Evil, it was necessary. And make no mistake, even now, despite understanding the need for it, I'm still not totally on board with a Resident Evil that doesn't have zombies and cutscenes for every door you open. 
Whether that's due to an overdeveloped sense of nostalgia, raw idiot stubbornness, or a little of both, I, I have no idea. And in light of how awesome 7 and 8 turned out, creating a coherent argument to justify that is becoming more and more difficult. If you think about it, with less than a quarter of the main games being defined by the staples of B-movie zombies and jump scares, Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3 now kind of find themselves an exception instead of the rule. And if that's the case, does it really make sense to continue to insist that those are the games that define the series? 1 and 2 may be my favorites, but do they still represent the core tenets that make Resident Evil Resident Evil? Ultimately, that's something you'll need to decide for yourself. And to be clear, I have not yet. What I am sure of, though, is that none of that prevents Village from being insanely fun. Which is not to say that I wouldn't prefer zombies, I probably would. I would prefer that all Resident Evil games be more like RE1 and 2 than anything else, and that games like this were just a separate franchise. These games are undeniably dope, but like, did you have to gut my Resident Evil to make them? I feel like you probably didn't. And lastly on the subject of expectations, before everyone starts sucking each other off with how awesome Village is and everything like that, remember the lesson that we learned from the RE3 remake. The RE2 remake was sick as fuck, and when it was announced that RE3 would be getting the same treatment, there was much rejoicing. Until it was released, that is, and was revealed to be exactly the type of by-the-numbers cynical AAA cash grab so many were convinced it would not be because they were too busy raw dog in the Capcom hype train to notice after RE2. Hacked together from reused assets and rushed out the door while the goodwill and customer faith created by the stellar RE2 remake was still fresh, customers were blindsided by the sheer triple anus of the new RE3. Triple anus, you like that? <laughs> That's awesome. Anyway, to critical acclaim, Capcom released a game that was a labor of love, painstakingly crafted to be everything that fans wanted, and then directly followed it up with one that, while disguised to look like more of the same, was actually the exact opposite. Even when released back to back by the same developer, there's rarely any discernible rhyme or reason behind which games end up being great and which turn out to be total shit. Don't forget that. Moving on, let's talk storytelling for a bit. Now, tying together all the plot threads and lore from bits and pieces spanning decades and like over 10 games, and having it not only make sense, but feel like a natural progression of the storytelling that's been earned and justified is not an accomplishment to be taken lightly or overlooked and cannot be understated. Especially if you do it within the bounds of a single game, which is what Village pulls off here. And when you consider that they accomplish that in a way that not only doesn't interfere with or handicap, but actually supports and enhances the primary focus of Village's storytelling, it sounds almost impossible to believe. Maybe I'll think of something later, but right now I, I can't come up with a single example of another franchise that's managed to execute a feat with that kind of scope. Maintaining a transparent level of narrative cohesion and reasonably consistent internal logic across any long-running franchise is a delicate and painstaking endeavor. Just look at Metal Gear Solid. And when you're dealing with one that has the history and content catalog of Resident Evil, it becomes practically impossible. In retrospect, it seems like an insane thing to even attempt an assertion that's reinforced by the fact that at least for a few games there didn't look like they were. I'm looking at you, five and six, and zero, and revelations a little. What the fuck even were those? I only played a little of the first one on like a Wii U or a DS or something, and all I remember about it is that it failed to hold my attention, very much unlike Village, which had me and my friends practically entranced the entire time. Next, let's talk about characters just for a bit. Ethan, as a character, for the most part is just a pair of hands that look like they're starring in a Saw movie for most of the game. Even so, the extent to which they really make him feel like the center of this narrative is pretty impressive. Despite myself, I genuinely found myself caring about Ethan and Mia and their deranged little domestic disaster by the end of everything. Fuck, they even managed to make Chris Redfield seem like an actual person, you know, like with a personality and shit this time. And let's be honest, he's pretty fucking cold. All that said though, the real stars of this game are the Metal Gear Solid villains, otherwise known as Moreau, Lady D, the Doll Woman, and Heisenberg. I'm shocked I didn't see anyone else noting this comparison. To me, it was one of the first things I noticed. And while I have no doubt many people hated that for varying reasons, I thought it was awesome. The bizarre mix of like pseudo-magic technology and over-the-top villain tropes, usually only showcased in characters like Vamp or Psycho Mantis, oddly feels right at home here. Even the Duke wouldn't be out of place in a Metal Gear Solid game. 
They brought an awesome sense of otherworldly fantasy that constantly keeps you guessing about the potential supernatural undercurrent that you can usually feel running underneath everything in a Resident Evil game. Now, of course, as in previous Resident Evil games, in the end, they always find a way to explain everything through mad science and technology run amok, almost exactly, incidentally, the way Metal Gear games do. In the end, how much you like this kind of thing, especially in your quote-unquote Resident Evil, is always going to come down to subjectivity more than anything else. What I can tell you as matters of empirical fact are two things. One, that I like it. And two, that from a technical immersion and narrative structure standpoint, they're exceptionally well implemented. As pure content, it is very well done. Whether the flavor of the content, in this case, the Metal Gear styled villains in their crazy werewolf village, appeals to you personally, well, I can't tell you that. That's up for you to decide. Moving on, let's briefly talk about visuals here. And I say briefly because if you have eyes, there's really not too much to unpack here. Obviously, this game looks fucking stunning. I couldn't believe the performance I was getting out of the RE engine too. Solid 60 FPS in 4K HDR with max ray tracing? It's absolutely insane. And for any PC Master Race people out there, yes, I know the ray traced reflections are displayed at a slightly lower resolution, and in some cases that ends up making them look kind of shitty, but that doesn't really affect the overall visual fidelity, at least in my experience. Um, I know others disagree, but like, I don't know, I didn't think it was a big deal. The fucking game looks crazy. There was times while we were playing through this that I actually was pissing my friends off because I would just sometimes just stop and gawk around at the environments in the engine. It really is that good. The gameplay footage and trailers barely do it justice. Uh, and also, again, just to give you an idea of like a spec baseline if you're playing this on a PC, I ran this on an i5 8600K overclocked to 5 gigahertz with a 2080 Ti running at what is essentially factory settings uh, with max ray tracing. Now, I had to crank down one or two settings just a little bit, but overall it ran great in 4K HDR at pretty consistent uh, 60 FPS. Now, sometimes it would dip down into the high 40s depending on where I was and if there was a lot of ray tracing, but overall, super consistent, totally awesome. This is also one of those rare games that look great in HDR. In my experience, most games that claim that they should be run in HDR end up just looking dark and washed out, but in Village, this is a, it's a really a serious improvement. While I was playing it, like if for some reason I tabbed out or fucked up the HDR, I would stop, save, quit the game, and then launch it again just to resume playing HDR. It made that much of a difference. Uh, otherwise, that's probably about it for this section. This game is insanely gorgeous, and I just don't think there's any room for discussion on that. Next up, we gotta talk about gameplay, which, in essence, is exactly what you would expect. Now, it's not Doom Eternal, so don't expect any insane FPS mechanics, and it's not an RPG or anything like that either, so don't expect any of that kind of depth. You shoot stuff, you gather stuff, occasionally you arrange that stuff in your inventory and combine it with other stuff, sometimes you even buy stuff. You've seen this before, you're seeing it again here, and it's great, it's fine, it's exactly what you want, no more, no less. There's even an enjoyable bit of agency that's offered by the many choices of consequence that you're constantly making by deciding whether to use the mats that you have to make healing items or to make offensive items. Do you want a few more pipe bombs or do you think you want more mines? Do you want shoddy shells or would you prefer to have the expendable reliability of handgun bullets? Nothing super crazy, but again, just enough agency to make your choices matter and keep it fun and actually make you care about engaging with the system, which is essentially what any good system does. Combat is similarly competent, if not mind-blowing. I don't think that's gonna come as a surprise to anybody. You point the guns, you shoot the guns, and it works great. I think they could have gone a little harder with the enemy variety, but the ones that you do face, they're well animated, they provide a good amount of challenge in how they're constantly moving around, and sometimes even effortlessly evade you. Their heads just seeming to slide out and away from your targeting reticle at exactly the right moment. So, it's frustrating at times, it's very good usually. This, however, is where my main criticism of this game comes in. Uh, I have two criticisms, but this is really the serious one. And that is that on standard difficulty, there's just not enough enemies. For example, unless you're busting around like in the basement of the castle, there are no enemies there at all, except for Lady D and her daughters. And the reservoir with Moreau, none. No enemies at all, just a boss fight in the end. And the dollhouse woman, it's an incredible sequence there, don't get me wrong, it's fucking awesome and one of the most terrifying creatures I've ever seen created for an RE game. But other than that, there's zero enemies. 
Now, in some ways, that's kind of cool. It results in you always being forced to cautiously creep around, never totally feeling safe, terrified of what new horror the game might throw at you out of a shadow somewhere, but the threat never eventually comes. Great for tension building and immersion, but not always the best choice for pacing. Even more unfortunately, this only works the first time you play through the game, and the illusion doesn't necessarily persist throughout your total time in each area either. So what may have started like as an eerie, nerve-wracking trek through a fog-shrouded forest, warily creeping from one shadow to the next, marveling at the light filtering through the creaking tree branches, turns into just you mashing the shift button down and plowing through each area without a second glance because you know you're perfectly safe and as scary as your surroundings may look, you know there's no enemies out there. Now, if this were actually a survival horror game, this would be far less of an issue. But it's not, it's an action game. It may present itself as survival horror, or try to tell you that's what it is, but it's not. It's an action game, and action games need action to work. Specifically in a shooter, you need things to shoot. Not enough of them, and you begin to wonder what the fuck is going on. It's immersion breaking, and worst of all, it results in huge amounts of wasted effort and missed opportunities. This is where I deducted the most points from. Now, my other main issue, though admittedly a much smaller one, is that, yo, the FOV here is boof as fuck. I like an FOV between like 90 and 105 personally. In this, it's less than 70 with no way to adjust it. It's fucking crazy. Fortunately, there is a mod that lets you change it, but come on guys, how can you not have an FOV slider in an FPS? That aside though, this game is about gunning down awesome looking monsters across an insanely gorgeous and at times photorealistic Eastern European horrorscape. Throw in some brilliantly designed big villains that seem more like they're out of the mind of Hideo Kojima than Capcom, and you've got a super fun and unique horror FPS for eh, about 10 hours. Sometimes it even references shit from previous Resident Evil games, but other than that, functionally, it's totally unrelated. And you know what? Eh, I don't give a shit, because I had a fuck ton of fun playing through this. And if you like the idea of gunning down horror slash fantasy monsters in an FPS, I bet you will too. By the way, that's uh, just what we're going to call these kind of games from now on. They're just horror FPSs. This is not survival horror, it's closer to Doom 3 with a few kindergarten level puzzles and an automatic shotgun. It's not really a Resident Evil game, and it's certainly not a Silent Hill game. But it is fun as shit, and considering the times we live in, you know, I will fucking take it. Okay, let's start wrapping this up. As is quickly becoming tradition around here, we're going to need to begin our conclusion by once again citing a lesson from one of our most cherished tomes, Nuance for Dummies. Fiction can be fun, but I find the reference section much more enlightening. Now, just because Village is good, does not mean that our interpretation of the industry is flawed, that AAA studios all of a sudden do deserve the benefit of the doubt, and hey, maybe they're not all avaricious anti-consumer monuments to disaster capitalism that prioritize profits over everything else. No, they absolutely do not deserve the benefit of the doubt, and yes, they absolutely are money machines designed to eradicate joy wherever they find it. That's not gonna change simply because once or twice a year, a decent game slips out that hasn't been gutted by paywalls or sabotaged with MAU farming Skinner box mechanics. No, what we're looking at here is more akin to the broken clock being right twice a day truism. Just think about it. It makes sense that constantly feeding tens of billions of dollars into an industry will eventually, every once in a while, whether by intention or circumstance, result in a quality product that's genuinely pretty awesome being produced. It's not that crazy, it's a numbers game and the numbers just favor that outcome. Most industries, especially those related to entertainment, operate just like this. That doesn't mean the AAA industry is suddenly miraculously reformed or that we should all fall to our knees and slob at the Capcom knob. One great game in no way guarantees another. We ended up getting a great game in Resident Evil Village. This time. One quality product does not mean that it's time to pack it up and go home. It's just as likely that the next one will be another RE3. And while I firmly believe that it's important to celebrate the wins, that does not mean that we forget the war. Nine, bitch. All right, that's our show. If you're upset that I like this game, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Sometimes shit is good. Rarely, but sometimes. And when it's good and I had fun with it, I'm gonna tell you. I know that's not as interesting as when shit is bad, but it is better ultimately. And don't worry, I'm sure 90% of the rest of the games that come out this year will be dog shit, so don't get too weepy on me just yet. You'll have something new to hate soon, we can only hope. And 
Also, just in case I was not clear earlier, and perhaps there's still some confusion, this game is definitely not Resident Evil, but it is fucking fun. And in the end, that's what I care about more than anything, and that's how I'm gonna rate shit. <laughs> Look, I had to pay for this motherfucker too, by the way, you assholes. It's using Denuvo, so there was no chance of a crack for at least a few months. So if you wanna play it before next year, you're gonna have to pay for it. That's how much I care about you fuckers. I paid for this bitch just so I could review it. Well, and also because I was pretty sure it was going to be dope. At least I wasn't disappointed, miraculously. That, incidentally, is why we will not be reviewing Mass Effect Legendary Edition, because that hoe's using Denuvo 2, and there's no way I'm paying for that. Anyways, <laughs> thanks for chilling with us tonight. Spend this little bit of your free time here. We love you today. We love you all the way. Hopefully, we can get back to talking shit next week. And uh, keep watching my channel, everybody. <laughs> this shit is fun. Hey,